Welcome, you guys. I'm so glad you're here. To you guys online, awesome that you're here as well. Um, and you guys, I'm Brooke. Um, I'm new around here, um, but I've been working in kids ministry for about 10 years. Um, before that, I was a high school teacher and coach, and then I stayed home for 10 years with um, kiddos. And then, uh, well, this is what my family looks like. So I've got four kids, um, two boys, two girls. They range from 13 to 20. So pretty much what that looks like is I don't know very much and I'm not very cool. That's like my existence, right? Because when you surround yourself with teenagers, it's really good for your humility. Hey, I'm hoping today, you guys, that this can be um, interactive. And I hope that we have stuff that we can share with you guys that is helpful, but also, man, anytime you can interject with something that's helpful, please do it. And you, Brooklyn, that is funny. No, but I play soccer just like her. The, the, <laughs> the question was, does anybody ever tell you you look like Abby Wamba? I mean, I'm okay with that. That is funny. Thank you. I, I like the interjection. Yes, yes. Thank you. Well, hey, before we go any further, let's, um, I think it'd be cool just to meet people at our tables. So how about you share your name, where you're from, and one little fun fact about yourself, just so we kind of get to know who we're sitting with. All right. It'll just be a couple minutes. All right, did you guys, did everybody get around their tables? You guys at home, I hope you shared with somebody nearby, especially the fun fact. Hey, so this is called Not Pinterested Ministry. Let me explain why. You guys are all familiar with Pinterest, right? Man, if that, so I was an art teacher, a high school art teacher. You guys, if that would have been around when I was a teacher, it would have like revolutionized not only my prep time, but my free time is, it's crazy what you can find on there. But here's the deal. Not like other social media platforms uh, or not unlike other ones, Pinterest presents kind of a dreamy, shiny way of life, right? So if you search something like front porches, right? On Pinterest, you'll pull up like the, absolutely most beautiful front every square inch of front porch is absolutely beautiful so is it inspiring yes but also daunting <laughs> also yes maybe even depressing at times especially when you compare your front porch right to those front porches so a couple of years ago during the summer, I was sitting around with a bunch of friends and we all have a bunch of kids. So it was summer, kids were all over the place. We were trying to work, we were, it was crazy. And we had this idea, what if we could unleash like an anti-social media platform? So we're at, we we're actually at our kids' swimming lessons and we pull up GoDaddy which is where you can like buy a website. So we bought notpinterested.com. So I still own it. So if anybody can, because we never figured out how we could then let people post to it. But here's what happened. Here's this summer. So uh, these are pictures from our actual lives. So this is actually mine. And that is an ingenious way to keep your oven closed when the springs break. So my daughter, who was like 12 at the time, came up with it. We had already fixed the springs once. It didn't hold. I didn't want to fix it again. So this is literally how we created, made the oven work, right? It's not Pinterested, right? Not dreamy. The next one, oh yeah, this is little Annie. So this is my friend Allison's daughter. And they go to the lake and they realize, oh man, we forgot the thing that covers her cast. So she had a broken wrist. So you know what that is? A grocery bag and a rubber band. Isn't that awesome? That's not Pinterested, right? Okay, a couple more. Oh, you guys, this is mine too. This is right across from the 
the way we were keeping the oven shut, if you turned and just looked like three feet away, this was when our dishwasher broke and it was summer and uh, we, it was still under warranty, which was awesome. But you know what that means? You are the absolute last person that they're gonna come to because they know that you're not gonna pay them. So for six weeks of summer, yeah, six weeks and a lot of phone calls, that's what it looked like to dry our dishes. So how about that? All right, one more, I think. Oh, two more, because I remember the last one. This is my daughter's hair and it was during the summer. And I don't know if any of you guys are parents or if you ever hang out with little kids, but sometimes at our house, we consider the pool to be also a shower. So this was a lot of day, like something might have lived in there. That did not come out without scissors, just so you know. We had to cut it out. And then this is the last one, because this is my girl's. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this is actually my favorite one. So my friend Bridget, her daughter is like five at the time. And she sees all these kids with water bottles with monograms, like cute little initials. And so Louisa comes to her mom and is like, mom, can I please have a monogrammed water bottle? And Bridget's like, yeah, of course, honey. Goes and gets a black Sharpie. And this was poor Louisa's monogram, you guys. That is not Pinterest, right? This last one, I just sent this to my friends and was like, I don't even know what to tell you. This is just a normal dinner. Like that is our dinner table. It's an outdoor dinner table and my kids had been swimming, but that was just like a normal night at dinner. So it's, what was cool is that we got so close during this summer because it was this, you were getting all these pictures that were just like me too. We're a mess. My kids haven't bathed in days. And it they're, they're some of my best friends now, which is really fun. I wanna show you one other picture. So this is my two best friends and they've been my best friends for 20 years. So I want you to think about, so one of them on the left, Allison turned 50 just a few months ago. So we actually came here to Chicago and got to hang out together. Um, but I want you to think about when you look at that picture, what words come to mind? And you don't have to say them out loud, but just take a minute to think what you think about when you look at that picture. So I'm gonna tell you what this picture doesn't tell you. And that is what we've been through the last 20 years as best buddies. So I'm gonna to read to you what that's looked like for us. An adoption that required turning a child back to his birth family. Cancer, multiple surgeries and chemo. Phone calls from elementary school teachers and principals, not the good kind. Kids struggling and facing difficult diagnoses. Kids in trouble with the law. Kids struggling with suicidal thoughts. A kid leaving home for residential treatment hundreds of miles away. Anxiety and depression in ourselves and our kids. Addiction, rehab, marriage difficulties, divorce, Navigating life as a single mom, custody issues, blending a family and realizing it wasn't going to work, difficult relationships with extended family members, illnesses and deaths of our parents, kids entering inpatient treatment for anxiety and depression, sexual abuse. It's not what you'd get when you look at that picture, is it? It's a lot like Pinterest. This quote, um, what we told, I, so I had these guys come in and we spoke to our MOPS group, which is mothers of preschoolers. And we just took the time to tell these young, sweet mamas who just want all the answers. We're like, you guys, if we told you what our lives have looked like, we have no answers, but we have each other. And so that's, that's our biggest advice to you, to you guys is to find your people. Uh, a quote that I think of often, it's from Brene Brown. 
It's we are the most in debt, obese, addicted, and medicated adult cohort in human history. And that quote, that was before COVID. So you guys know what COVID has wreaked, you know, just the effects on, on all ages. So you guys, to present our churches and our ministries on Sunday mornings as shiny and buttoned up and as if we have it all together actually causes people to feel even more alone. We can have beautiful churches and pastors delivering epic sermons and people dressed in their Sunday best. But it's also important that we balance that with our real lives. It's not one in place of the other. It's both, right? All the time. So how do we do this in ministry? What does it look like to invite the people we lead, our fellow staff, our families and our churches into real life together. So I want you guys to go back to your tables. And this time you guys are gonna go around and just tell one thing that you're okay with sharing that's kind of difficult that you're up against right now. And have one note taker, you've got a note card in the middle of your table. Don't write names on it, but just tell me what, what things are people up against? All right? You guys, thank you for doing that. So, and you guys uh, online, thank you for, I think you chatted yours out. So um, appreciate you guys connecting in that way too. In the room, um, some of the things that were named were that um, a pastor head pastor was let go, um, hard to be a part of that community right now. Um, there was somebody else at that table that's a first year pastor and has a one year contract. So bought a house and is just hoping it keeps moving forward. Um, another person at our table moved for a job, um, but has a 10 year old who's really struggling, um, feels like all his friends are still at home. Uh, somebody else graduated and moved to Indiana during COVID, have yet to find people, feel isolated. Somebody else has a family cancer diagnosis. Uh, figuring out where I'm supposed to be, how I can feel fulfilled. Another one's sister was in an accident, spent hours in the cold, bruised spinal cord, can't use fingers, self-employed. A child with anxiety, a friend with a child struggling with identity. <clears throat> um, other people are asking how to extend ministry in church and online. We're all working through that one, that's for sure. Uh, recalibrating our identities. Who are we moving? Who are we moving forward? What if we are no longer the big church? It's a good question. Lack of attendance, how to, prayer, how to prepare for it. It's discouraging. Whoever wrote that, we feel you big time. Our team does. Uh, balancing a new job and a new denomination. Being authentic to myself in this role while doing justice for both. You guys, that's hard stuff. So I want you to think about when we went around the tables the first time, right? And you just you introduced yourself and, and, and had a little fun fact about yourself. I want you to think about on a level, just think in your head one to 10, what was, what'd you feel like your connection was with the people around your table? Yeah. With just the fun fact, right? So kind of think of a number in your head, like, ah, we were, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, now think about when you met around your tables the second time and you shared something that was made you vulnerable, that was a hard thing. What do you think your connection level was between one and 10? It's eye opening, isn't it? How much more connected we feel when we're willing to be transparent, even in the hard things. 
So you guys, how do we do this with the people we lead? This is what my team, Kate and Kenyon and I are all the children's ministry um, office from one church. And this is what we've been working through for like three years now. What does this look like? How do we do this? What does it look like to live our real lives with the people we minister to? How do we invite our friends into connection like the second time we met around our tables? How do we lead with strength and focus, but also with a vulnerability and transparency that invites the people around us into real community? People are looking for a place to belong, to feel heard and seen and known and understood, to feel accepted despite their baggage. Well, how did Jesus do it, right? He walked with all kinds of people, sick people, well people, prostitutes, tax collectors. Jesus didn't just lean into the shiny people. He also endured deep pain, betrayal, and ultimately death. So you think he doesn't get it? He gets it, man. Have you guys ever heard the term wounded healers? Have you guys heard of that? Henry Nouwen wrote a book on this title, and I love these words I read recently um, from Richard Rohr. He's talking about this concept of being a wounded healer. He says, the genius of Jesus's ministry is that he embraces tragedy, suffering, pain, betrayal, and death itself to bring us to God. There are no dead ends. Everything can be transmuted and everything can be used. Everything. He goes on to say, as Paul says, on the cross, Jesus becomes the sin and the problem. He identifies with the wound, the pain, and the suffering in 2 Corinthians 5.21. He does not stand apart from it. He enters into it. Jesus tells Peter, Peter, you must be sifted like wheat. And once you have recovered, then you, in turn, can strengthen your companions. Until there's been a journey through suffering, I don't believe we have true healing authority. We don't have the ability to lead anybody anyplace new unless we have walked it ourselves to some degree. In general, we can only lead people on the spiritual journey as far as we ourselves have gone. We simply can't talk about it beyond that. That's why the best thing we can do for people is to stay on the journey ourselves. I love this line. This is still Richard Rohr. He says, we transform people to the degree we have been transformed. When we can somehow be compassion, not just talk about compassion, when we can be healed and not just talk about healing, then we are, as Henry Nouwen said so well, wounded healers, but not before. So how do we do this, you guys? How do we become wounded healers? A good pastor friend of mine often asks um, ask us this question. What is something in your life personally that disqualifies? Let me start that again. What is something in your life that you believe disqualifies you that may actually qualify you? Let me say that one more time. What's something in your life that you believe disqualifies you that may actually qualify you. In other words, what have you personally been through? Probably something pretty difficult that your experience and your learnings may actually help somebody else in that same situation. For me, here are my three, divorce, cancer, struggling kids. I get calls all the time. Ha more than half the time, I don't even know the people, but they're friends of friends that are just starting down one of those three lanes 
and people are like, oh yeah, call Brooke, call Brooke. So I, you guys, like there are two people um, going through chemo right now. I did that a few years ago. And I, like all they want, you guys, is somebody a little further down the road to look back in their eyes and say, yeah, this sucks. And this is really hard, but you're going to be okay. That's all they, I don't have any expertise except that I've already done it, right? So what's that for you? What's something that qualifies you? And is it possible to bring your personal expertise in this hard thing into your church? We're gonna, I'm gonna tell you guys um, a little bit about what we're doing at our church in Kansas City as we've walked out these last three years, really trying to walk through what, these, what this looks like. And I'm gonna give you some examples of what we are doing. And if at any point you guys, I would love for you guys to add to this list. Um, and this is in your little handout that's in front of you. Um, and you guys online, it should be, you should be able to get to it. The, the title page is not Pinterested Faith. And then it just has a bunch of these questions. Probably should have told you that 33 minutes ago, but I forgot. So um, I'm gonna address some questions that are on there. So the first one um, we were asking ourselves is how do we walk alongside our folks in the trenches as well as in the shiny. Here are some things that we've thought of at our church, and then if you guys can add to this, awesome. One of them is we're just really trying to intentionally be transparent and vulnerable in our conversations with each other as staff, with other families that we're talking to, with the rest of our staff. We're just, we're just trying to be better friends to people. We try to invite people into relationship who are experiencing the same things we have. You guys, this is interesting. So um, 10 years ago, um, I went to a church and was going through a divorce and I had four kids. My youngest was three and somebody, a pastor, actually the children's pastor from the church that I went to knew that I was going through a divorce and just sent me a note that said, hey, do you want to do you want to grab coffee? I've been there. She was not a good friend of mine at the time. Fast forward another year, and that was why I got into children's ministry, was because this person had invited me to coffee and then was like, why don't you just come work with us? So that, I mean, it was, a, it was one person reaching out to meet at literally Panera across from my kid's school. And it turned into, I texted her yesterday, actually, because I don't work at that church anymore, to be like, dude. I'm teaching at this conference and I love how much you poured into my life. Like you taught me to believe that I could do stuff like this. So do that. I mean, it's, it's so simple, but we just don't do it very often. Another thing that we're doing, we hear a lot about parents trying to navigate kids and their technology. So we happen to have um, a group in Kansas City that started a nonprofit where they'll come um, do workshops about technology and trying to parent through it and what that looks like. That's something that every parent believes they're in the trenches in right now. So that's something, it's called START. And that's an acronym for something that I can't remember, but look that up because it's actually really cool. Another thing that we haven't done yet, but something that I've been thinking about a lot. So our pastoral care pastors are both good friends of ours. And I think about how many families they walk through grief with and what could we do for the kids? And so, so we're thinking about partnering with them. You talk about in the trenches, man, when you've lost a parent or grandparent or whatever that a brother or sister, that would be an in the trenches moment that we could walk alongside people. What about you guys? Do you guys have any, um, any and you guys uh, online chat it out and We'll chat um, and we can throw stuff that you guys are doing out there too. But in terms of, of kind of in the trenches, 
times where people might be hurting. You guys have anything that you're doing that would be cool to share that maybe we could all learn from? Not everybody at once. Yeah. She, for you guys online. For sure. <clears throat> yeah, so she said Stephen Ministries, interestingly, during the pandem pandemic, people have actually shied away. Isn't that interesting, you guys? Like, so many more people are hurting. We know they are. It's like every news story. It's We have a good friend who's a, a therapist that's doing a bunch of stuff with us and our families. It's unbelievable. But it's also people have gotten comfortable being isolated, which... It's, it's just hard, you know? Um, Mo, one of the online folks, Melissa from Westminster Press, says that they have a small group for spiritual direction with those going through the trenches of divorce. Cool. I would have done anything for that because I couldn't find it when I was going through it. So a small group for people going through divorces is awesome. Also, Steph says our congregation is developing a mental health ministry. We have a task force that sent out a survey last year to see what the issues are affecting people in the congregation. And Carrie says cooking for one classes for widows and divorcees oh. who find themselves living alone and are in need of cooking inspiration. I love that. Those are awesome ideas, you guys. Um, the mental health initiative, if, if your church isn't tapping into that right now, man, it is, it is time. We're, we're doing a ton with mental health professionals um, right now. That's actually, let's let that lead into the next, the second, the next question we were asking ourselves, how do we equip kids and families with a life is hard, messy, resilient faith? Because I don't know about you guys, but a lot of us grew up kind of with the um, the thought that if everything's going really well, God must be really present. And then when things got really hard, you're like, "What did I do wrong? Why? Why has God? We gotta we gotta teach kids that's not how it works, you know. So that's something we're really we want them to have a life is hard, messy, resilient faith. One of the ways we're doing that. So we're calling it coffee and conversations. And once a month for an hour, we're bringing in a local mental health um, professional and they're just talking to people. So we bring in, um, we send it out to our parents that, that work within children and family ministry because that happens to be our role. But we also put it on social media of the church at large so that anybody can come to those. And they're amazing. So we're just asking local therapists to come in and be like, I don't know, man, give us some hope. Um, another thing that we've done recently is we built, so we have three floors because we have one floor that's a preschool and then we have a second floor and then we have a third floor where all the uh, classrooms are. So we purposely put parent resource walls on all three floors and we're just putting like books that we hear about that maybe people might be inter interested in reading. We put anything either going on at church or in the community, just any way that we can encourage parents, grandparents, caregivers of any kind, we're trying to do that. The other thing um, is just getting involved in missions. Last summer, we took uh, June, July, and August, we did three different local nonprofits. So June was one nonprofit, July was a second, um, August was a third, and we brought the CEOs in of the nonprofits. They talked with our kids, they showed videos, and then the, the next three weeks, we just did stuff about and just talked about, man, that's super hard. Can you guys imagine? It just made it sticky because they met someone who knew all these people that were impacted. And we do also, we just try to do, um, you know, d competitions with bringing things in, diapers, peanut butter, things like that. And then talk to kids about people who need, um, who are in need and how that can be us sometimes too. Do you guys have anything else about the 
kind of in teaching kids the life is hard, messy, resilient faith. Anybody have anything they're doing? Oh, cool. And you do it once a month. Okay, so on Wednesday nights, do you meet every Wednesday night? But one time a month, you do a certain mission project. Cool. Yeah, so work with a mission partner that they're already connected with and then build on that the, the following three weeks before you walk into the next one. That's awesome. I love that. Um, Connie online says we are providing support for those who are caring for or caregivers for those with dementia and Alzheimer's mm. and um, Carrie awesome. suggests that they are trying to program for people who have experienced the loss of a child mm. and also LGBTQ two plus youth cool that's awesome Oh yeah. Yeah. So cool. Awesome. So the first thing Ken said was that they do a book club and it's intergenerational. So any age, kids. Yeah. Okay. Age 11 and up, as long as they can read. Cool. Oh, that's fantastic. So they, I don't want people online to miss that. So at the end of the month, they read once a week, their book club meets for one book. And then at the end of the month, they actually deliver something to the houses, like a little treat that has to do with the book. That is so cool. I love that. Kenyon, we've been thinking about book club. I like your idea, Ken. Yeah. Cool. And you call it the six eight program project. Yeah. Okay, so you go into a, a neighborhood with a lot of need and either help with rehabbing houses or picking up trash, things like that. And it's all ages. That's awesome. So Ken said they try to form a relationship with the people within that neighborhood so that they can get to know one another. So do you keep going back to kind of the same areas? That's awesome. Great idea. So at least, that's awesome. At least once a week in these neighborhoods. That's amazing. Very cool. Do you have Kelly, one? Kelly, oh, sorry. Kelly from the online chat says they are offering art therapy sessions for Ooh. the youth. Kelly, let's connect my friend, my new friend. Because that's what my degree's in, art education. So I love that idea, Kelly. Let's talk. Oh, preach, girl. Yeah. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. Right. Right. I love that. So she was saying, make sure that even from the pulpit, you're sharing honestly about things such as what you're learning in therapy, the things that are hard. You said, speak from your scars, not from your wounds. And I want to know what you mean by that. Okay, that's fair. Right. Okay. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know what you meant by that, but I love that. Um, so by speak from your scars, not from your wounds, she was just saying, wait until you've had enough time to be able in, to engage in a way that's helpful for others rather than, um, well, we won't unpack what it could look like, but that's smart to just, yeah, just wait a little while. Um, another question that we've asked ourselves um, is how do we help people understand that God is with them even during the hard? Um, one of the things that I do often, so we um, give a little daily devotional to our sixth graders and we just buy a ton of them. And every person that comes to me and says, people come to me all the time when they're hurting, I think just because <laughs> a lot of people know my life's been kind of a mess. And so I just give those out. I mean, it, it literally, like we budget to give away books to try to encourage people. Um, so that's one thing we do. Um, we try to reach out to people either via email or phone, just especially when we hear somebody's going through a hard thing. Um, handwritten notes. When's the last time you got a handwritten note? You know, like that's a super easy um, way. You don't even have to engage in personal conversation, but you can throw a few sentences together just to let somebody know you're really thinking about them. Barb. Right. Um, but um, going through the, the difficulties, oddly enough, the, the struggle that I'm dealing with with our chapter, his wife knows that I'm struggling and I get messages from her every single day. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, sometimes twice a day, checking in with me to see how I'm doing. So, um, you know, it, it doesn't have to be text, doesn't have to be handwritten. Right. Right. You know, she doesn't expect a response, but it's just like, you know, brushing her through the day or, you know, yep. the day going. I got off the plane, I had a message waiting for me to say, welcome to the Bible. Uh, but, so, you know, those and these are texts, right? I mean, just encouraging. I'm thinking about you. We're with you in this. It's funny. I talked with a friend actually this morning. We have another friend that's going through chemo right now. So she was like, I don't know. What do I like I, what's the right thing to do? And that was, I was like, send texts. Like it is not rocket science. Write down the day she has chemo. Like every time she has chemo, send a text. That's just like, dude, from nine to two today, I'm going to be thinking about you because right now nobody can go in with you, um, which, oh, that would be, I had all my people around me. So I can't even imagine what that looks like. Um, but yeah, it's the simple things sometimes that build us up the most. The last question we've really been asking is how do we invite people into friendship and community? What does that look like? You know, I always tell people, I feel like we're Jesus's worst PR. Like we present him like he's lame, you know, like he's, I don't know. I just, I, I, I think about how I grew up in church and what it looked like. And it just felt so separate from the rest of my life. And so it, it felt quite honestly, pretty irrelevant. And I think we're trying to be like, no, it's like supposed to be fun. This abundant life thing is supposed to like be a good thing, you know? So here's some things we're doing. We, we do family bingo nights. So um, 
And we have another guy that works with us and we're wired a lot alike and we're very sarcastic to each other. So we purposely are both on mics that night and we just banter. And then kids jump in, adults jump in. It's so fun. And it's, so, you guys, it's like an old school bingo thing, you know, like the metal, like where the balls come out and it's kids will read them. I mean, it's so easy and so fun. Um, another thing that we're going to try this year for the first time, we're going to try family VBS. We're going to do it because it's so hard to, to establish relationships with the parents that we're like, man, we need some time to hang out with these parents. So we're going to try it and we don't know what it'll, what it'll be like, but we're going to do it four Wednesday nights in June. And we budgeted to feed them dinner. So just a simple dinner, we'll order it in from somewhere cheap and easy. And we're trying to get families to just come hang out with us. And we're going to try to make it really fun. Um, we're going to do it outside so that we can, you know, be unmasked and give everybody some space. And, um, we talked a couple of years ago, my, my headline was bring back the potluck. And I was like, don't you guys remember? Like people would just linger and hang out. So what's the potluck of today? So we're trying to design, we have a lot of space in our church. So we're doing a family lounge right now, a game room. Um, we always have coffee near classrooms. Like we try to lure parents in to hang out with us. We always have candy in our office and a bunch of toys. Um, I used to be a basketball coach. So I really want, I'm like, just give me a basketball goal in the, in the, I don't care where it is, just put in the parking lot and I'll just shoot baskets with kids. Like anything that you can do over and over that's not that hard, just feels like a home run. We do a lot of um, fun family events during COVID. We did drive throughs. If we never have another, another drive through, I'm going to be super, super happy because, oh my gosh, it was crazy. Um, we do newsletters for families and, um, we just started doing a separate newsletter for teachers to equip them with the whole month's lessons. Cause we have some that really want to read ahead. So we're just trying to stay connected. Um, on Sunday mornings, we invite teachers to come to our office, um, 15 minutes before they need to be in the classroom. And we try to just go around and do like highs and lows or something to give everybody a chance to talk and to get to know one another. Um, we also always have granola bars, coffee. Um, we try to meet like simple needs in our office. Um, we do a trunk or treat. We just started doing that during COVID and we um, happen to be right across the street from an elementary school. So we put a big sign out front that says, you know, open to public, come hang with us for a, a trunk or treat. Book clubs, Ken was on our list. Um, we do Wednesday night family dinners at our church, which has had to stop um, now because of uh, COVID, but they're, they're actually drive-throughs as well, but they're coming back. Um, and last question, I told you that was the last question, but I was lying. The last question is actually, how do we widen our wingspan to become relevant to more people? We ask ourselves that a lot. Um, we're, our church has never had a ministry for kids with special needs. So that's a major thing that we're doing right now. Um, if you have any interest in this, there happens to be a nonprofit in Kansas City. It's called SOAR, S-O-A-R, and they are brilliant. They have helped us so much as we've thought through what this is um, going to look like at our church. Um, you know what? I totally skipped a, a part, didn't I? You were supposed to raise your hand and be like, dude, you left something out. Hey, here, this is one of my favorite visuals ever. And I don't know if you've heard of this again or before, but there's, um, there's such an opportunity in our suffering, you guys, to shine God's love and power through our cracks and scars and broken parts. So there's this type of pottery. It's a Japanese technique. If anybody knows how to say this better than me, kintsu curry. And it is the coolest thing because it illustrates this. So they take broken pots and the parts that are broken, like the edge, the broken edges that were the, the least valuable, 
they fill with gold. So the broken parts become the most beautiful and most valuable parts. To me, that's exactly what we're doing is just taking the hard, broken things, adding God to the equation, sharing it with our people, and then it can become such a beautiful, beautiful avenue for community. You guys also, um, I wanted to ask you, are you doing this? Are you living vulnerably with your team? This is my team right here. And we have one other, one other buddy at home with your staff, with your volunteers. We have such a team mentality, poor Kate and Kenyon. They were already at our church in Kansas City when I came three years ago. And they were like so grateful that I was gonna take so much off their plates. How many things have I taken off your plate? Zero. You know why? Because I'm terrible at the things they're good at. It's totally true. I mean, it is God ordained that we are a team because you know why I have a presentation, like a, a little, what do you call it? Presentation. It's not PowerPoint. It's Canva, which I've never heard of because Kenyon created it. I didn't do it. I don't even know how to do that. Right. And Kate, like we had our big budgeting meeting um, last week. And I was thankfully out of town so Kate could go. I'm horrible, like I have a degree in art. I, sh I can't even budget for myself, much less. So we do this constantly, you guys. We're, I mean, my first day I was like, here's the things I can do, here's the things I can't. And we do that all the time as a team and it's so freeing. We were at the wrong gate when we were trying to get on a plane to get here. And you know who was in charge, me. So we almost didn't get here. We almost ended up in Denver, which that would have been okay with me. Um, but I think that's, and your handouts, you guys. I don't know how to do that. Kenyon did that. So d utilize your team by being vulnerable with what you're good at and what you're not. I love that. Um, we've also done self-discovery among our teams to figure out how everybody's wired. I don't know if you guys are Enneagram people, but things like that where you can figure out man, this is what I'll bring. And then like on the Enneagram, you read all these awesome things about you and then you turn the page to the back and you're like, oh yes, oh, it's brutal. Cause it tells you like the things you're terrible about and mine were very true. Bottom line, you guys, just like today, we're all in this together. So if we can do that as our staff and as with the people that we minister to, I was just in Colorado. So it's my favorite place is Colorado. And I just got to go snowboarding with my brother um, like a week ago, two weeks ago, something like that. And I was reminded, have you guys ever heard about how aspen trees, what their root structure is? So when you see a, a grove of aspen trees, we have some aspen trees we're going to show you. So uh, the yellow, the yellow, that's fall aspen trees. They're all one organism. So a grove of aspen trees, like the root structure is all one structure. And I love that. I love the thought of, man, how do we do that with our people? Lastly, you guys, I believe it starts with us, how we're spending our time, what our personal spiritual life looks like. Like, I don't know if you guys are, are cognizant, like during COVID, when we were all just depleted, discouraged, scared, how good were you at ministering to others? Probably not great. We were all drowning, right? So we've got to be aware of what do we need to be able to pour into others. Have you guys ever heard, I love this Mother Teresa quote, if you want to bring happiness to the whole world, go home and love your family. Isn't that an awesome quote? Start with what's right around you. So in order to lead our teams well, authentically with vulnerability, we have to personally be in a healthy place, especially in our relationship with God. So how do we do that? And in just thinking about shifting to our own personal faith journeys, I would ask you guys, because this is really hard to do in jobs like we have, are you creating time to rest? to listen, to explore, to
to lean into God in your own personal faith? When? What does that look like? What would a healthy schedule look like in order to give yourself time and space to receive before we're able to pour out? I love, I keep going back to this verse. It's Romans 15, 13, and we're going to look at it. So one of my favorite things to do is go to um, Bible Gateway is the site I typically use, but there are different um, translations of the Bible where I love words are really important to me. So where I'll look it up in multiple versions. And then that's what I was doing for this. And I was like, we got to put all three of them on there because I love these words. So the first one is um, the NIV Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I love that. The, here's the New Living Translation, the NLT. I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. And lastly, here's the Passion Translation. Now may God, the fountain of hope, fill you to overflowing with uncontainable joy and perfect peace as you trust in him. And may the power of the Holy Spirit continually surround your life with his abundant or with his super abundance until you radiate with hope. Did you guys notice all three of them had the word overflow? And I love, that's my favorite word in there. God fills us so that we can overflow to others. So is God filling you up? Are you taking time to receive? So this, I'm just going to, I'm going to end with reading you guys something. This is a book by Ann Voskamp. It's called The Greatest Gift, Unwrapping the Full Love Story of Christmas. And I try to read this book every year around Christmas. But here's what it says about Mary, the mother of Jesus. She became a space. Mary, she opens her hands and she nods. And the promises come true in the space of her surrender. The pod of the most high God lodging within her willing yes. There's no need to produce or perform or perfect. Simply become a place for God. That is all. Mary kneels before us this first Christmas, not as a woman producing performing or perfecting, but simply bending before a God who has all the power to dispatch angels, enfold himself in embryonic cells, choreograph the paths of stars, a God who quietly beckons every man, every woman to simply come, bend, make a space, receive. This is the chronology of grace, the chronology of Christmas, before we're called to give, we're called to receive. And I also love this part about overflow. It says, you will be experienced as a blessing to the extent you have first experienced yourself as blessed. You must feel, you must feel the fullness of your own pitcher before you trust the pouring out of yourself. Only when you first unwrap the gifts of blessing to you can you be wrapped up as a gift of blessing to others. Only when you are overwhelmed with the goodness of God can you overflow with the goodness of God to others. So I'm going to leave you guys with a little treat. Let me get one. All right, so... I have this thing. So because I'm, I'm a drawer and a painter and an artist, I, I think super visually. So sometimes, especially when I'm reading scripture or books or whatever, I'll, I like have this, I can see just a picture of something um, as I'm reading. So like five or six years ago, 
um, I was reading, it was actually about the overflow. And I just keep seeing this kid holding up, I don't know why it's a red solo cup. That may say too much about my college days, but it's a kid holding up a red solo cup under a waterfall. And he's just trying to, he or she, I don't know, I can't see the kid really, but I can see the hand holding up a red solo cup, just remembering to stand under the waterfall and just overflowing. So you guys have a little more candy because that's how you become friends with people. And then um, it has that verse that we looked at, Romans 15, 13, on a little bookmark. So you guys are awesome. It was really fun to meet you. And we can do, if you guys have any questions or anything you would like to add, um, we've got a little time. If you need to go, you can go. Is there anything from the, you onlineers, thank you for hanging with us. Two any things, the name of the book and Boss Camp. Yes. What's the title of it? The Greatest Gift. The Greatest Gift. And um, what is the name of the devotional that you give the sixth graders? So we give a devotional called Jesus Calling that you guys may have heard of. I don't know that it matters so much what it is, as long as it's something that represents hope and encouragement. Um, I, that happens to be a devotional that I've been reading for like eight years straight. Um, so I give it to other people, but it could be anything again. Hey, also, and then we'll answer any more questions you might have, but I went ahead. So one of the things we do is um, every year we bring in probably an extra six or eight people that are volunteers within children and family ministry from our church. And we do a day at my house where I just make breakfast and we hang out and we try to think about, we do some praying and we really try to think about what God might be wanting us to do this year. So we just brought our, and then we, I take a bunch of notes. So it says like dreaming and brainstorming 2020. And then we turn that dreaming and brainstorming into our mission and vision for that year. And then in 2020, we remembered to go back and count our wins, like to remember, hey, what of these did we actually do? Um, so I made copies of all that stuff for you, just so that if anything's helpful, take it. If it's not, leave it. You will not offend me. But I just tried to bring some stuff that might be helpful. I, the woman who just came in and, and said, hey, are you all set up? I was like, dude, her name is Jan. I was like, Jan, I'm here because of your workshop. Because two years ago, the first time I came to APSI, I happened to go to Jan's workshop and I swear like half the things we're doing were things I got from Jan's workshop. So I just hope there's something you can walk away with that might be helpful to your people. And I'll be here to hang too. Anything else from our onlineers? All kinds of thanks and praise. Oh, that's very nice. Very nice. Thank you guys. Go girl, go girl. I'm unoffended, unoffended. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Absolutely. So our newsletter creator is right here in the red sweater, Kenyon. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, well, can we go back in and I don't know how any of this works really. So can, can we add more things under, can I, can we go in and what'd you say? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Or how about this? If you want to see our emails, either to teachers or to um, parents, tell Kenyon. <laughs> Kenyon does all the things. I just show up. Kate does all the spreadsheets and logistics. I'm a mess, but I love Jesus and you guys and M&Ms. Anything else? We good? Barb. Enneagram, E-N-N-E-A-G-R-A-M. You guys do it and then email me and tell me what your number is. I'm obsessed with the Enneagram. You're a one. I love you ones. 
to? Uh, no wonder you're so sad about your son. You're like a, you're such a lover. Oh, uh, I love that so much. Who's a two? Oh, you guys, I have a lot of two in me too, but man, it's exhausting, isn't it? Sometimes you're such good caregivers though. The rest of us are so grateful for you for real. And ones, ones, you get stuff done, man. What are you, have you guys done it? Okay. You're, you're both twos. I forgot. Oh, I made them do it. I'm a seven. I'm a mess, man. What? No. Yeah, I have some of that in me. I just like want to go where the next party is. But clearly I need a lot of backup. <laughs> what? Rock and roll. We used to at the, I love that. At the last church I was at, all the sevens planned our staff retreat. So like we would all just get in a room and be like, yeah, let's have, let's have them do a scavenger hunt on the way down. Let's see how many. I mean, it was horrible and so fun. It was so fun. Well, I'm so glad you guys were here. I hope something was helpful for you. Nice to meet you guys.